Singh was Chuck's sponsor for 13 years. Chuck was involved with the World Service Office till the mid-1980s, including service as Secretary Treasurer and President at one time. He was the board of trustees. Chuck served as the World Service Conference Chair and Vice Chair in the early 1980s. And I'd like to call Chuck C. I guess I gotta turn this on. Okay. Now I'm just talking a minute. And uh first I wanna start by, by thanking this committee and uh this area for uh, for having me here and for uh uh the warm uh, support that I've gotten and the warm uh, uh atmosphere that's that's been uh, a part of this this get together. I appreciate uh, appreciate you people being here and uh, letting me uh, letting me come here. I never planned on uh, on doing a history on anything, <laughs> and definitely didn't come into Narcotics Anonymous with a plan on on uh, being a old timer here or being uh, any. Any time longer than 30 days. I didn't want to have anything to do with uh, any kind of organization, and uh, definitely did not want to be around any people. And uh, I um, came to my first narcotics anonymous meeting in 19, 1970, and uh, I. Uh, didn't know how fortunate I was to be able to come into Narcotics Anonymous. I didn't know that it was just a small fellowship, and I, I had no idea that uh, that it was just mainly in, in California, and that uh, and that I was so fortunate to be a part of it. I went to my uh, I was hearing other people talk, and uh, it was just bringing up a lot of a lot of feelings of. Uh, the different things that have taken place, and I've looked at some of the pictures and and uh, and heard some of what other people have said, and I, I just uh, it brings up a lot of feelings. Uh, the, the first meeting that I, the first NA meeting that I went to was in uh, in Van Nuys, and it was on uh, Sherman Way, and it was uh, right off the of 405 there. And it was uh, it was at a church, and. Um, the thing that I remembered about the meeting was that there were uh, that there were addicts that were talking, and they were talking without having anything in their system. And I remember sitting there thinking, "Well, this guy's not going to talk." And then he'd go ahead and talk. And then I say, "Oh, but no, I can tell by looking at this person, they're not going to talk." And then they'd go ahead and talk. And. Uh, and Gene may have been at the first meeting uh, that I went to. I know Bob Barrett was, was definitely uh, one of the people who were at my first meeting. And uh, in fact, I, I remember some of what, it's amazing, my memory is not too good. But it, there's some things that really stick out. And there's, uh, there's some things that I remember. And I remember one of the things that, that Bob said was he said that um, once you go through these steps, because my plan was when he was when he was, they were talking about the steps, so I get get those things up through with real quick, and that'll be it. Uh, I won't have to worry about it anymore. And he uh, he ruined it all for me because he said, no, once you finish these steps, you continue on doing it for the rest of your life. This is the way we live. We find these steps. And I said, oh Lord, this is not good. Um, my biggest fear was that I was going to have to talk to narcotic clowns. My biggest fear. That was, well, I had, I had a couple of fears. The biggest fear, one of the biggest fears was I was going to have to talk, and the other one was I was going to have to go to work. Yeah. <laughs> Those both happened. I had to start talking, and I had to go to work. Yeah. But I, uh, I'll jump up to... Uh, Really, when I first uh, ran across Jimmy, 
all the people uh, at that time, most of the people were, were younger. But there was somebody that was, there was one guy that was, was older than, than all of us, really, than most of us there. There was one other older guy there, I forget his name, but there, there was really two only old people that I knew of. And when I say old, I'm really meaning that he was younger than I am now. So, <laughs> he's really a young guy. <laughs> and it was at uh, the reprieve house, it was a, a recovery house, and, uh, and my, uh, the guy who was my sponsor at that time, my first sponsor, took me out to this house, and there was regular meetings that we had there. And there was this uh, there was this old guy and, and he was talking. And I remember what he was saying too. What he was saying was he was talking about uh, he was talking about how uh, no matter what you're going through, there's always somebody that's going to want to switch places with you. No, but no matter what you're going through, it, there's always going to be somebody that's going to want to switch places with you. And that was the gist of what he had shared. And I thought, man, this guy, is, this, that's good. That's, that's, uh, and it, 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 there was a part of me that I think it felt better. And I remember asking, uh, my first sponsor was, was Jeff Shane. I know uh, uh, Gene remembers him. Not around anymore. But... Uh, I remember asking him after the meeting or talking to him, he said, Who's that old guy? That's, that was, that's uh, Jimmy Kenneth. Yeah, he's, he's, uh, you know, he's like a powerful, powerful influence around here. So, oh, okay. And, uh, I, uh, you know, when I look back, I think the fellowship has changed a lot. I think it has changed. And I think it's changed for the good. When I first got here, there was, uh, <laughs> There was no hugging. You didn't hug. I mean, that was that was it. You were, you know, you shook you shook each other's hands, and that was as close as you got to anybody. And uh, you may hold hands at the end of end of the meeting, but that was it. In fact, I thought that was a good thing. That I thought, man, the NA is really close. They hold hands at the end of the end of the meeting. But as far as hugging anybody, that wasn't happening. You know, the fact that if you try to hug somebody, you, <laughs> you make a hit. <laughs> um, I had to go away for a, for a, for a while. I came directly out of uh, out of jail into narcotics and I was I was uh, out on bail for the first eight months of, of going to NA, and then I had to go away for a while. And when I came back, people were hugging. I said, "What's going on here?" <laughs> I remember the first guy that gave me a hug, I, I, I kind of had to step out. What's going on here? You know, it was, uh, I couldn't believe that uh, that, was, that was starting to happen. But that was a good thing. I always seem to resist the good things. You know, the things that, that I need. And that was one of the things that I needed. Because I needed, I needed to be closer with other people. To, be, to get that, that hug and that, uh, that personal that personal effect from other people. I needed that. I still need that today. You know, I, because uh, uh, my nature is to back away. My nature is to be off by myself. And I believe that's also the nature of, of addiction, is it wants us off by ourselves. I, uh, my, my first sponsor ended up uh, going back out. He got loaded. He got loaded. And uh, I asked uh, I asked Jimmy to uh, to be my sponsor. And uh, I didn't know what I was putting myself into when I when I did that. I didn't know what was because uh, one of the things that that uh, Jimmy believed and uh, and he would tell you was that. Uh, if you're if you're grateful, you better show it. Don't talk about it. He'd get very upset if you were talking about being grateful and you weren't you weren't showing how grateful you were. So he believed in action. He believed in working. You know, if you wanted to do something, you better start going to work and doing it. Or it didn't mean anything. 
you know, it's, um, it's very easy for me to talk about being grateful to Narcotics Anonymous, but it's harder to actually do what I'm called on to do, I believe. Is to, that if I am grateful, then I really need to show up. Now, I had, uh, I'd had about three years clean when I, two or three years clean when I asked Jimmy to be my, my sponsor. And, uh, what I tried to do was just to kind of follow what, what, uh, what he showed me how to do. And so he, he was very good on, on, uh, having other people get involved. You know, he, he, uh, he got to, somebody else was talking about, uh, that he, uh, was asked to do too much, uh, and somebody else would, he asked you to do it. Well, Jimmy was like that. He was, there was getting to be too much, he'd ask you to, to, hey, why don't you go do this? And that was, uh, that was a good thing. Because he got other people involved. I, uh, I want to, uh, a lot of things that, you know, back then, or then Gene talked about a little bit too, is that, hey, you know, we were, in order to to make this history happen, the only thing that really happened was we were just happy to be here. You know, I just happened to be at some of the different spots that took, took place, and I uh, wasn't uh, wasn't anything that I was uh, really going after, but it just happened. And one of the things that I went to the first conference, and that was a uh, and Jimmy was there, and Greg was there, and uh, I know Bill was there, and, uh, and I didn't even know what was going on. I didn't even know what conference was. And, I, and, I, and it was, this was the uh, first time that I ran into uh, to uh, Bob Stone. Bob was actually the uh, the parliamentarian for the – he was going to be the parliamentarian for that one. It didn't work out too well with that one, but he was trying. Uh, and he went to the uh, – they got they had this, the conference put together to where they they wanted to have it run right. And Jimmy had asked asked Bob to kind of come up there and be a parliamentarian for the for the conference, so they would go smoothly. So you get a bunch of addicts together that if they never had anybody tell them, hey, this is the way that we should do this. Oh, it, was, it did not go well. It did not go well. <laughs> they, they were not ready for uh, for a parliamentarian. Yeah, but uh, Bob was uh, pretty courageous there. He went ahead and he, and, he, uh, and he tried to do the best that he could, even though there were some people that wanted to throw him out of there. And, uh, hey, what's this guy doing here? He's not an addict. What's, what's going on here? And, uh, uh, but it, uh, that was, that was the, uh, the first... Uh, Conference and uh, I got involved in the uh, in the World Service Office again by not something that uh, that I planned on doing. I just happened to be hanging around with Jimmy and, and Jimmy took over the office. The, the office was uh, was really being folded because there was really nobody else that wanted to take over and uh, and Jimmy decided, hey, well, I'm going to take it. Over. I'll take it over and. Uh, trying to do the best I can with it, and he, and he took it into his house. And he had it in his house for, uh, I don't know, nine or ten years. Uh, uh, oh, no, he had it in his house, I think, for about six years, and then they, uh, then they moved it over to another spot. But, uh, and when I say they had it in his house, I know, I know, uh, probably not too many people have been to his house. Some of the people that, that talked have been there, but he didn't have, like, a big elaborate house. I mean, he had a... A little house that, that uh, he lived in before he came to the Sinarchist Mountains up until the day he died. And it was a little uh, little house in Sun Valley, and it, uh, it didn't have hardly any room in it. And, he, uh, and once he got the office going, he, he added on a little room that was probably, uh, I don't know, six by nine or somewhere around there, and that was the World Service Office. That was that was the first office, really. I mean, that's, and uh, what he would do if you were uh, if you were involved with him, if you if you were being sponsored by him, or he uh, you wanted to come over and talk to him, right? You got involved, and then you'd be uh, you'd be doing things, you'd be sending things out, and you'd be uh, uh, mainly working. And I, uh, 
when I look back, I was thinking about this. When I look back, I think those were those were some of the the happiest times in my recovery were to be involved in, in doing stuff like that. And uh, and it was and I think the big thing was that I that I was not in the limelight. I was uh, <clears throat> I didn't like talking, uh, so I wasn't speaking. You know, I was just I was. Uh, I was just working. I was working to try and, and do something better for a for NA and and it was just a feeling of uh, yeah, this is the right thing to do. This is the right thing to do. And I uh, I miss those times of doing that. Uh, those times of you know, and, and other people talk about this. That that's some of the things that have that have changed here is uh, is uh, that uh, is not as personable as it uh, as it used to be. I think it can be. I think that part of that uh, part of that is uh, is my fault. I need to make it more personal. When, I, when anything happens, it always comes back to me. It always comes back to me. What am I doing? You know, what am I doing to make this thing better? You know, I'm always uh, I'm always ready to uh, put the finger on somebody else and say, Hey, they were the ones that did this or did that. And it always comes back to what did I do? And that's the only thing that I can change is I, I can only change myself. And, uh, uh, but getting back to that, uh, you know, uh, we had a lot of good times over at uh, Jimmy's house, and uh, and he uh, he definitely loved to talk. He loved to talk. And if you if you start talking to Jimmy, in fact, if you were a newcomer, that's the person you really loved to talk to. If he got a hold of you, you were not going to be loaded for a while because he's talking to you. <laughs> they used to say that he was, uh, it was harder to get Jimmy uh, off of talking to you than it was to get off of heroin. I mean, <laughs> and that was probably true. I, mean, I know there were times when he'd be talking to me, I'd be thinking, man, yeah, what is this guy going to shut up? <laughs> I want to go. But there was other times that I felt like, man, he knows exactly what's going on with me. And I thought that he was so, uh, I thought that he, that he knew so much about the program that I thought that he knew so much about me that I thought he was reading my mind. I really did. I thought, this guy knows, he knows how to read my mind. I don't know how he's doing it, but he's reading my mind. He wasn't really reading my mind. He was. He just knew what was going on with the with the man, and that, that I was so much like any other addict. That that was it. And I, uh, the craziest time that I that I had in narcotics and uh, Jimmy was there. Craziest time. In fact, there was a lot of crazy times. But the the craziest was that uh, that I. Uh, I was going through this thing with, with what was going on in my mind. I was just, I was flipped out, just flipped out. I, was, I had all these crazy, sick thoughts going on in my head, and I, and I, uh, I could not get rid of them. You know, I, I tried to start going through the steps with it, and I, and I went through the first step, and I, you know, I, and I thought, well, okay, yeah, I am definitely powerless over what's going on up here. And then I went to the second step, and I thought, man, I, yeah, I am crazy. You know, I, so I, yeah, I need, I need God in my life, and I need God to, to take care of this for me. And I went ahead, and I prayed, and I asked God, please remove this from me. And I got no relief. And I thought, oh, man, now God's not even working, you know, and, and, but God was working. See, I don't know the way God operates. I think I do. Just like I think that I know how you people operate inside your head. And I think I know what's going, what you're thinking. And the worst part of it all is I, I get to believe, I start believing that you know what's going on in my head. And sometimes you do. But there's other times when I'm hurting that you really don't. That I've not, I've gotten to let you know what's going on in order for you to know what's going on. And you need to do the same with me. You need to let me know what's going on in order for me to know. And that's why, this, that's how this thing works, is we share with each other. And that was the thing that I didn't want to do, is I didn't want to share what was going on in my head with somebody else. 
And I, I believe that Jimmy, not even Jimmy, he's well as, as long as he's been around and as, as spiritual as I thought he was and all that out there, he, he's not going to know what's going on with me. He's not going to know. And I believe what was happening is, is my God was telling me, hey, I'm going to help you, but you're going you're gonna to need to share this. I thought God wasn't working, but he was really working. And I, uh, and I went ahead and I shared this inventory of what was really going. Because I had shared other inventory before that, but this one was a, this was, this was stuff that was going on since I came to Narcotics Anonymous. Not stuff that was happened before I came to NA. It's easy to justify the stuff that you that happened before you came to NA, but when you start having all this stuff happen when after you come to NA, then you're thinking, man, I'm weird. This shouldn't be happening. And that's what I felt was, hey, this shouldn't be happening. And I went ahead and shared it with him, and, and, uh, and I believe that was probably one of the times that I thought, man, this guy knows, knows how to read my mind. Because he knew exactly what was going on with me. And he said, hey, that's just the disease out to get you. That's, that's what's out to get you. And, I, and that still holds true today. Is that stuff that I want to hold on to and not share with you, that's the stuff that's going to get me. Um, I, uh, I don't know how I got into the position of, of being on the, uh, the part of the World Service Office, but I, uh, other than being through Jimmy, but I, uh, you know, it, it, everything was so small then, and before then. In fact, when I, when I first came to NA, you held different positions. You were, you were, uh, you were the... You'd be you know, like a GSR in two or three meetings. I mean, that was not unusual at all because the meetings were so small and the fellowship was so small that you would just you take on you take on other commitments. Okay, I remember going to one of the meetings and they'd say, well, okay, well, who's going to represent this meeting? I'll, I'll just going to raise their hand. I'll do that. And, then, and you'd raise your hand for two or three meetings. So you'd be representing them all. And, um, that was where we, I think we ran into problems with the growth, with this thing. Narcotics and Anna started to grow. But we didn't have the people to, to help it grow along. We, it was growing so fast, and that's what I think ran into, we ran into a problem at the office was that we, that this thing was growing so fast that there wasn't, there wasn't the volunteers to help this thing along. This is worth the volunteers to help it along. Everybody likes to uh, point the finger, including myself, and say this and this should have been done. But a lot of times, the people that point the finger don't like to do anything. That was what happened when I first came here. I wanted you to do everything for me. I just want to sit here. I wanted to be. I wanted to be out there sitting down while somebody else was up here talking. That's the way I was going to work with this uh, NA program. I will just sit there and not do anything. And that's what we do sometimes today. We just want to sit and not do anything. Let somebody else do it. So much easier to let somebody else do it. Then we can criticize them for how they didn't do it properly. I believe that happens a lot. And I do it myself too. I do the same thing. <clears throat> but when I'm uh, when I'm doing something, I don't want to be criticized. I don't want to be criticized. And we took a lot of criticism uh, on the different things that took place at that time, and probably still taking criticism for some of the stuff that took place. You know, but I think like somebody else said, I think it was Sally. Hey, we all tried to do the best we could. We all tried to do the best we could, and I think that's what happens. Is, uh, you know, one of the, one of the things that uh, I was having a hard time with uh, with a guy that I was working with, and, and I went to Jimmy and I said, "Man, I I can't uh, I can't put up." This guy was my partner. I said, "I can't put up with this guy anymore," and he's driving me crazy. And he said, uh, he said something very important to me. He said, uh, "I think he's trying to do the best he can." And that lightened it all up for me. I started thinking, yeah, maybe he is trying to do the best he can. And that's what I don't do a lot of times. Is I don't believe that, that some, of the, some of the people that I'm involved with are trying to do the best that they can. 
that some of the people in the fellowship are trying to do the best they can. And I get these resentments going, and I and I uh, and I destroy myself. And that's always what happens. And when I get into the resentments, I destroy myself. I destroy myself. I uh, getting back to Jimmy. I uh, we were just talking a little bit about this before the meeting. You know, he. Uh, he had this little house that uh, that a lot of us visited. Whenever he'd go over there, first thing he'd do, he'd pull out this little cup, put it on the stove, and he'd cook it some coffee, cook it some hot water for you. I hope I find that cup someday. Boy, I'd love to see that again. I didn't mean it so much that he would <coughs> that he would take the time to make it feel welcome. That would be the first thing that he'd do. Let's have some coffee. Let's sit down and talk. This thing was all black and beat up and it was only about as, about as big as this around and uh, but there was something special about that. Then he'd sit down and we'd talk. Or he'd talk with, with you know, he loved to talk, like I said. And he loved to record it, too. Because he's always thinking about the future. Always thinking about how he could benefit Narcotics Anonymous in the future. And one of the ways that he believed that he could benefit it was by having things down on recording. So if you were going to be talking and he was going to be recording you, and uh, that's the way it was going to be. I uh, remember seeing him uh, spend many a day of going over and, and uh, to some of the recovery houses, or one of the recovery houses, and and he would spend time over there with uh, with the uh, with the new people and going over the steps. And he recorded he recorded what was happening there with the with the steps. And that was his uh, that was his main emphasis was he was always concerned with the with the newcomer and how he could how he could help the newcomer. You know, uh, was he was he perfect? No, he definitely was not perfect. None of us are. He did things the way that he thought that they should be be done in order to help the newcomer at that time. You know, and sometimes I remember being at a meeting with him one time and he was he didn't write in the Right in the middle of when somebody was talking, he just started talking and saying, no, no, it's not like that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's the kind of guy he was. That you knew exactly where you stood with him. You know, and yeah, if you crossed him, yeah, you may, be, uh, you may not be able to talk to him for quite a while. Or you may not ever be able to talk to him again if you thought you crossed him too much. But that was, that was the way he was. You know, he felt at the time that he was doing the right thing. And he used to he got mad at me a few times and then uh, he'd get upset at the, some of the different things that weren't coming down right at the World Service office or that maybe you weren't packing the materials right or you came in and you, you slumped out doing something there, but he was always uh, he was always thinking of what uh, what was best for the fellowship, and if you weren't doing things right, and then that wasn't best for the fellowship, then, then you shouldn't be doing it. You know, you should try and do it differently. So I, um, you know, it, there was a lot of controversy and a lot of things that were happening uh, back around the time of when the book was coming out and before the book came out, and uh, uh, like I said, I think uh, the... Uh, the majority of what I see is what happened was there was uh, there was not enough help. There was not enough help, and there and the uh, and the office took the heat for it. And uh, uh, yeah, the office did need more help, and they did need uh, um, they did really did need somebody in there that was getting paid because Jimmy wasn't getting paid. He wasn't getting paid. He did all this uh, all this for free. You know they. For many years, he took you know, like fifty dollars a month was what he, it was allotted for for storage. Now fifty dollars a month is nothing. And then at the end, there was raised to two hundred dollars a month. 
That was it. That was what was taking place with uh, as far as his pay. He wasn't looking for any more money. He wasn't looking for anything like that. The main thing that he wanted to do was to, was to carry the message out there. So he was trying to do the best he could to get the message out. And uh, I, uh, I was involved with that uh, when the uh, the book was turned over to the World Service Office to to be printed. And it, uh, it was a very, very trying time then. But like Sally was saying, the book was turned over and, then, and Jimmy uh, wanted to keep his loyalties to, to the people who were already printing literature. And the office, we felt that the, the office, that the, this printer would be able to do it. And the printer turned out to be, uh, <laughs> turned out to be one of us that was still active. And I remember, uh, going over there with some of the other, uh, board members and running into this guy that had burnt us. And we all had our hopes on the book being out. It was like kind of like dealing with uh, with uh, the connection. I mean, it was. <laughs> it was he kept telling us, "Well, uh, it, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow, it's going to be all right. We're going to have it tomorrow." And of course, uh, after a while, we finally had to check out and went over there, and uh, and we had been burnt. And I'm uh, <clears throat> not really a physical guy. I'm, I don't. Uh, I like fighting and all that, but that, that was the only time I felt like, man, I need to check this guy. <laughs> but uh, this guy was just off into the disease, and, he, and we got burnt. We got burnt. You know, but uh, again, that wasn't anything that, that anybody had planned, and I don't think anybody really made a mistake there other than putting some trust in somebody. And uh, it was trusted that somebody had already placed in these people before that had done a good job. You know, so, uh, you know, we, uh, I think we've all tried to do the, the best we can, you know, the, uh, uh, I think the thing that really took off when, when I saw the office that, uh, I made some notes here, but I, I saw, when I saw the office, uh, I, I, I took notes because I, uh, I thought I was going to forget some of this stuff, and I probably will forget a lot of this stuff, but I, that was one of the things that Jimmy used to do. He used to take, take all these notes, and uh, when they'd ask him to go talk and stuff, he'd, he'd write down all these different things that he, he was going to say, and he had it all done, and then he'd, he'd leave, leave the house and he'd say, I forgot the notes. <laughs> you never did need the notes. I mean, he, he had all that stuff, but uh, he was always doing that. And uh, we'd spend 10 or 15 minutes looking for the notes from where he, where he put them, and they were, we'd never be able to find them. Because he, he went over to his house, he had all this stuff all over the house. It was just packed full of stuff. He never, he never threw anything away. He kept everything that had to do with narcotics and them, he kept it in his house. He had it somewhere. The problem was he wouldn't be able to find it. Um, we have the book that, uh, that came out, and uh, to me, that's uh, we needed that book. We needed that book, and when it came out, it was it was a very big thing, and it was uh, there was a lot of controversy on it. Like I was said, a couple of traditions there, and what was going on with the book, and how it was done, and all that. But, uh, but that's when that's when things started to happen because that's that's when people started letting up on their money that we should have been getting earlier before that is when and that's when the fellowship I believe started to grow is because we had a book we had our own book now we can pay more money for people to uh, to work in in, uh, in our offices, we can have the higher help that we need. Well, what what happened was that after all of this this time that, that Jimmy had uh, that had put into this, <coughs> he 
you got too big too quick. This is my opinion. You got too big so quick that they felt that they needed to have a higher hand in there. They needed to have somebody that was paid. And I think that that was that, I think the things worked out the way they were supposed to work out. But I think the way it was done was not was not done correctly. It was not done right. And I um, I'm not going to get off into all that, but I have to take my spot here. You know, I was involved in that thing at that time, and I remember them uh, at the conference voting that they needed to to have a. Uh, a uh, hired manager, and, and the manager should be Bob Stone, and that, that Jimmy was, gonna, was going to be uh, like an honorary member. That was the way it was supposed to be. And he was still, he wasn't going to be kicked out of the office, but he was not going to be the manager anymore. He would be that they were going to lighten the load for him. Of course, that's I don't think it was the real intent there, but that, that's the way it was, was came across at the conference. And uh, I was the uh, president of the World Service Office at that time. So really, it really wasn't my job to go back and, and, and tell Jimmy that what was happening there, but it, it, as a friend, it was my job to do that. And I tried to sugarcoat it when I went back to, to tell him. And that wasn't really the right thing to do. And if there's any way that I ever felt that I had hurt Jimmy, that was the way that I felt that I had hurt him. Because I didn't know the words. I didn't know what to tell him. What What do you do? What do you say? To somebody that's being replaced like that. So I didn't know what the words to say to him. I've always felt bad for, for, for the way that that came down. And I think that, that, the, that the fellowship had to take the responsibility for that too. That we had a plan at that time on how that Jimmy should be replaced. But we didn't have a plan on how that should happen or who should, who should tell him or how it should take place. The only thing I think we were thinking about, the fellowship was thinking about at that time, was that there needed to be somebody else in there. And that was, that was, that was, that was wrong. That was wrong. I, uh, like I said, to be loved to talk. Love to talk. Up until the day he died, that's the thing that he was doing, was talking. I still have a tape at home of him and Peppy talking in the in the hospital. Now he's got cancer. What you want to talk he didn't want to get into uh wasn't getting into, hey, what are they gonna do for my cancer or anything like that? The thing he was getting into was about narcotics and animals. And that was his talk with Peppy. It was about narcotics and other. How can he keep this thing going? You know, we talk about uh, a vision for narcotics and other. One of the visions that I think that Jimmy had for narcotics and other is that, that this thing never dies. That it never dies. One of the things that he, he had done, and I'm not quite sure what year it's going to be dug out. But he had a time capsule. It was supposed to be dug up in 2010 or 2020, somewhere around there. But that was his, that was his, his thinking. It was always ahead of how I, how can he benefit the fellowship. So the thinking was that if anything happens with this, with this, this whole thing gets blown up, this world ends or whatever, and it's restarted. The there's the, the uh, struggle for having Narcotics Anonymous or getting Narcotics Anonymous started will happen rapidly. 
that it that it's in this time capsule on how to how to do this thing. So he wanted to make sure that it was going to keep a lot. Um, I think there's a lot of other people that are that are quite instrumental in narcotics analysis. Quite instrumental. I think Jimmy Jimmy was the one that took the ball and ran with it and they handed it to a lot of other people. I think there's a lot of people that are instrumental in this thing staying alive. And one of them is, is, uh, is Bob Garrett. Bob was, uh, Bob was around when I first came around, and uh, if, if wherever you go, Bob would be there. He would be there. He was at the, like I said, the first meeting that I went to, he was at the first meeting that I ever talked at. Bob was there. I remember, uh, because well, like I said, I had a hard time uh, hard time talking. And I went to the, the meeting and it was said, uh, Yuck and Gower. That's the meeting I went to and I remember it was uh, Ed. Mentor was the uh, was the leader and Bob Bear was there and there was just a, uh, and I hadn't talked. I, uh, and, this, and I believe this was, this was like the beginning of my recovery. This is when I felt like I, I became a part of narcotics and then Ed uh, called on me and he said, uh, Chuck, do you have anything to share? And I learned that if you don't want to share the narcotics and you just say pass. And I said, uh, my name's Chuck and I'm an addict and I pass. Then he came around again and he said, Chuck, you sure you don't have anything to share? <laughs> and he caught me off guard. And I said, yeah, my name's Chuck, I'm an addict and I feel inferior. And that was exactly the way that I felt, is I felt inferior. And there's times where I still feel inferior today. But Narcotics Anonymous has made it to where I don't feel inferior all the time. That I've got a way to go. And that's what the people before me have, have made it possible for me to have a way to go. I was uh, somebody was talking about Gene and, and uh, talking about backpacking and being able to build. And that was the first thing that I heard Gene talk about. Man, that sounds all right. Go backpacking. You know, to be able to, to do that. You know, I've been clean 33 years now and uh, I'm still haven't gone backpacking, but it sounds like good. <laughs> but I have done a lot of other, other things. And I think that's what narcotics and others does. Is it opens up, it opens up a whole new life of things that I knew that I, I that I would never ex want to experience or experience. And that's what has to happen. Is we have to open up our we have to open up our minds to let these experiences happen to experience new things. And whenever I shut down and think that I don't want to do this because it may be too scary. Or it may be too tough for me to do. Then I shut off my God. Because he's trying to express himself through me. To help me. To carry me on. And I don't grow any further. Like, that, like the first time of, of, I used to, I used to plan out these different things to say. And uh, how I wanted to talk. And, uh, and uh, to sound. And I'd listen to other people. And they'd, they'd, uh, they'd be so profound in the, the different things that they would say. that I'd try and copy them. And it always came out all messed up. It always came out all messed up. And it doesn't really matter what I said. It really doesn't. The thing that matters is what am I doing? What do I do when I leave here? What do I do at home? When you're not looking. That's the important thing. What do I do when you're not looking? And that's what I want to try and do. And, I, and, I, and one of the things I want, I also want to emulate Jimmy. One of the things that he did was when you weren't looking, he was doing the same thing as when you were looking. He was doing the same thing as when you were looking. He did no, nothing differently, I believe. Now, I, uh, this program, I believe, takes a lot, a lot of, uh, a lot of courage. It takes a lot of courage. You know, it, it's not, uh, Jimmy said that at the, at the 20th anniversary. I was also privileged to, to be at that, at that event. I, uh, I had three years clean then. 
there was a there was a, probably a group about this size. There was a, the 20th anniversary of it, and one of the people that, that did speak, and if you've heard the tape, it was Jack Whaley, and he was he was my character. I remember I remember talking to Bill and saying, man, that guy really scares me. Because <laughs> boy, if you were new, he was he was. Uh, you were actually scared to probably uh, leave Narcotics Anonymous if, uh, because if you were coming back, he was definitely going to be talking bad about you. And he was going to be talking bad about you if you were even here. <laughs> but, uh, but I believe also that he had, a, he had a warm heart. He had a warm heart. And his... <clears throat> I think it takes all of us, all of us, in narcotics and animals, to make this thing up. To take special people like Jimmy Kinn, to take special people like Jack Wheeler, like Bob Bear, Gene, Tim, all the different Sylvia, all the different people, and all of you, all of us together. We've all got a part to play here. I uh, used to get hard on myself because I was, uh, back, I mean, people talk about this, uh, that, uh, <clears throat> back before recovery houses, you know, the only place to go was somebody else's house. That was the thing. I had a wife that wasn't on the program, and I had a small boy. And I wanted to bring other people into my house. And I tried to do that. I ran into a lot of resistance from my wife. She was scared to death of having that out. <laughs> so I, I still feel today the same way that I, that I felt back then that, and I, that I had decided what I had to do was I had to, the main thing that I had to do was I had to carry my load. I had to carry my load. No matter how I did it, I had to do that. That there was other ways of me doing things. And I think that's what, what happens here. We're all, we've all got some different specialties. And we, if, when you go out, we look at that specialty that you have. God has a plan for each one of us that are here. We have to stick around and find out what that plan is. And the big thing that we have to do is that we have to follow through with that plan. You know, that I was uh, calling with this because I know my time is up, but uh, it was it was a it was a very heavy event for me the, the 50th. And, it, and the and the heaviest part for me was really one of the things that Gene had done that reminded me that no, the most important person is is not helping somebody else. Indeed, you have pictures of that, or what happened there, and, and taking this guy, and that was uh, we was just off the streets. And I remember we were going up, we were up, up on the stage there, because we were going to be big shots and be on stage. And I remember thinking, well, trying to tell Gene, well, we should leave the leave the cell down down here with some other friends. James was saying, no, I think we should take him with us. I think we should take him with us. I don't know if that was the, uh, I, don't, I don't know if I would have wanted to be, uh, there was 20,000 people there, so I, I don't know if I would have wanted to be my first day out in front of 20,000 people with quite lights on me, but the powerful thing that it brought home to me is, no, that's, that's what this thing is all about. That's what we need to do. It's help each other. And it's not always just the newcomer. Sometimes it's the old timer that need help. We are all in the same boat. We're all here in this thing together. And we may have our differences. We may not see things the same. But I believe that we're all all our goal is all always the same. I know that there's people that I have a difference with in, in this room. But I know for sure 
And if it came down to us helping somebody else, then we would be united. We would be united. And that's the way I believe that God wants us to be. No matter what our differences are, we need to be united helping each other. Thank you.